If you'll take your Bible and turn to 1 John 3. 1 John 3 is where we're going to be today. Uh, we're continuing our, our series in 1 John, uh, and we are actually wrapping up this middle section of the letter uh, that's gone from 1 John 2, 7 all the way to the end of chapter 3, and he's had one primary goal in this section, and the one primary goal is to communicate to us that part of the evidence that we are followers of Jesus is that we love other followers of Jesus. Um, John writes this letter to a group of churches around Ephesus, and he's writing it because a group of people are going around and teaching false things. One of the things they're teaching is that you can love Jesus and not love followers of Jesus. It doesn't, in other words, it doesn't matter how you treat other Christians. It doesn't matter how you treat brothers and sisters in Christ. And John writes this to confront that false teaching, and he says over and over that we should love one another. This is not a new commandment. This is, it's, it's new, but it's not new throughout 1 John. And he wants us to understand and know that this is part of the evidence that we are followers of Jesus, that we love other followers of Jesus. Now, that evidence doesn't make us a follower of Jesus, but it does show that we're a follower of Jesus. And so loving one another is really critical. Now, not only are we to love one another, but he wants us to love one another, love other believers in a very particular way. He wants those who belong to Jesus to love others who belong to Jesus like Jesus. Jesus. And so he's not going to let us keep love at an emotional level, at a feeling level, at an I have a good feeling toward that person sort of level. He's going to push it down to a very practical on the ground sort of level and he's going to call us to love one another. It's a command in the passage. It's a challenge in our daily lives and it's necessary evidence for those who are followers of Jesus. And so uh, that's where we're going to be today. Uh, 1 John 3, I'm going to read verses 11 through 24, and then I'll pray and we'll jump in. Let's start in verse 11. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and see his, sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we, we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of, the, of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of gathering to study it today, to sing and to, and, and, and to be with each other and, and to have the opportunity to, to sit under your word. So Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, not just to understand what this passage is teaching, and, and some of it is complicated, uh, but help, so we ask you to help us understand it. But Lord, we really want to live this out. Uh, we don't just want to understand the passage. We want to live the passage by your grace and by your power so that we might demonstrate to the world what it means to love others. So Lord, would you help us? Give us uh, grace for this moment to understand. Give us grace for that moment to live. And uh, Lord, we, we so desperately need you in order to fulfill what this passage calls us to do. And so Lord, give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that are receptive to and responsive to your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So our big idea from the passage is that those who belong to Jesus love others who belong to Jesus, and we do that like Jesus. Okay? Those who belong to Jesus love others who belong to Jesus, and we do that like Jesus. It's a command in the passage. It's a challenge in our lives. We're going to start with the command. Look at verse 11. It says, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That word message is translated command in 1 John 1, a very similar word. Um, the, the idea is that it is a command 
that we have heard from the beginning. So this is not, uh, this is not something new, really. It's something that's, that's actually very, very old. We've heard it from the beginning. And the command is that we should love one another. We, believers, John's writing to, to churches. He's writing to Christians. We should love one another. We should love other believers here. Now that gets spelled out more clearly in verses 16 and 17, but John is already speaking to this idea that Christians should love one another. Now there's certainly a sense in which we should love others too. Jesus speaks about us loving our neighbor, and, and there's certainly all kinds of examples throughout the Bible of us loving everyone, but John here is specifically talking about those who belong to Jesus, loving others who belong to Jesus. This is a command. It's not new. It's from the beginning. We are to love one another. Well, then he gives two examples. One is a negative example or something we should not do. And then one is a positive example or something we should do. Let's start with the negative one in verse 12. It says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So John starts with this negative example, and he says we should not be like Cain. Now, uh, the story of Cain and Abel shows up first and shows up in Genesis four. In Genesis four, Adam and Eve have two boys. One's named Cain. Uh, he works the field, uh, and he brings an offering of grain to the Lord. And then there's this other brother named Abel. Uh, he works with animals, and he brings uh, a sacrifice of an animal to the Lord. Now we see in Genesis 4 uh, that God had regard for Abel's offering and he did not have regard for Cain's offering. Now lots has been written about why and what was going on there. Uh, it's not because of what the offerings were. Uh, because throughout the Old Testament, God uh, speaks of grain offerings and, and other offerings from the field. And so it wasn't what the offerings were, it's what was going on in the heart of the two men. So God had regard or gazed at or noticed or, or accepted Abel's offering. He had no regard for Cain's. And it wasn't, again, because of what he offered. It was because of what was going on in Cain's heart. We're going to see more about that in a moment. So Cain gets angry. The Bible says in Genesis 4 that his face fell. Well, God sees his heart and knows what's going on in him. And so God confronts him and he says, why are you angry? And then he warns him. He says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Sin is like an animal that's about to pounce on you and destroy you. And then he says, and you must rule over it, Cain. Cain, you're in a dangerous spot right now. You're angry. You're, you're jealous. There's something going on in your heart. Sin is about to destroy you. You've got to rule over it. Well, Cain does not heed that warning. And he goes into a field, finds Abel there, and he kills him. Kills his brother. Then God comes to where Abel was and he says to Cain, where's Abel? And Cain's response is, I'm not my brother's keeper. No, it's actually a question. Am I my brother's keeper? And what we see from this response and, and his action toward his brother is a heart that is all kind of twisted up with sin and evil. Cain did not love his brother. He had pride and jealousy in his heart. His brother was competition, not a companion. But eventually he could not deal with that and he killed him. And John tells us, don't be like Cain. Certainly don't murder your brother, but that goes deeper. Don't, don't hate your brother. There's all kind of heart issues going on with Cain. There's all kind of stuff going on beneath the surface with Cain. And John says we should not be like Cain. Now, I, I want to be very clear. I don't expect that any of you uh, have a list of Christians that you want to kill today. All right, I don't, I don't expect that any of you are, uh, you know, have a list of people you want to take out because uh, they've kind of, you know, hurt you or done something. I don't expect that any of us are that way. But you might have someone you're jealous of. You might have someone that has more than you or different than you. You might have something going on in your heart toward another believer. And I believe God would say to us, hey, sin is crouching at your door. Like you're in a dangerous spot if you let that fester and grow. And that hard issue is going to result in an action. And again, I'm not expecting that you're going, to, you're going to murder another brother, but you might kill them in your thoughts. You might take a thought and kind of brood on it and just let it ruminate and grow and grow and grow and grow. And then you have a narrative about this person. 
Doesn't matter if it's true. You believe it. You've killed them in your thoughts. And maybe you'll take that another step to kill them with your words. The Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. We can kill people with our words to them. And we can kill people with our words about them. We can kill one another by harboring jealousy and envy. Cain is not our example. We, we should not be like Cain, John tells us. We should not be like him. He's not our example. Cain's actually the prototypical bad guy. If you watch movies or read literature with, these, with bad guys, bad guys, someone else always has to die to accomplish their purposes. They, they never sacrifice their own life for their purposes. Somebody else has to die for their purposes. Cain, Cain doesn't love anybody. We should not be like Cain. But there's an example we should follow in verse 16. He says, by this we know love. By the, so this is how we know what love is. We've got this command to love one another. By this we know love, verse 16, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. Cain hated his brother. His brother had to die for his purposes. Jesus loves the brothers. He died for them. He laid down his life for us, the just for the unjust, the sinless for the sinner, the righteous for the unrighteous. In 1 John 2, it says that he is the propitiation for our sins, the satisfactory payment that appeases the wrath of God. Jesus laid down his life for us. He died in your place. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. Us. And then John continues in verse 16, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That word lay down is the same word as what Jesus did in the beginning of the verse. The way Jesus died is the way we are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus loved us by laying down his life. We love others by laying down ours. And not only is this a command, but it also confirms something in verse 13 and 14. Look at that with me. John says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. John is saying, look, the world is supposed to hate, we're, the world is supposed to hate believers. Don't be surprised when that happens. Don't be surprised when things are said about believers. Don't be surprised when things are said about what believers believe. Don't be, surpri don't be surprised, he says. But in the family, we're to love each other. That's what he says in verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life. In other words, we know that we're saved because we love the brothers. Now, I want to be really clear. Loving the brothers doesn't save us, but it shows that we have been saved. We, have, we know we've passed from death to life because we love the brothers. It's evidence that this has happened in verse 14. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Did you notice that he changed? He went from murder to hate. So don't be like Cain who killed his brother. Don't be like Cain who hated his brother. Because everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so those who belong to Jesus love others who belong to Jesus and we do it like Jesus. It's a command. It's a command. This is not like an optional opt-in. Like this is a command that we're to do. And it's a challenge. Point number two, the challenge. Now the challenge is that loving others is hard. And loving others is not simply an emotional response to them. It's not simply a good feeling toward them. There are some very practical, on-the-ground things that John calls us to in this passage, starting in verse 17. He says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So we see a Christian in need. It says a brother. We see a Christian in need. We have what is needed. If anyone has the world's goods, so we have what is needed for the brother's need, and yet closes his heart against him, then John asks a question. How does the love of God abide in him? Like, John's asking, how is that brother a Christian? So these are significant questions, like eternal matters here. And so we need to know and understand what's going on in this passage. 
There's a backdrop to this passage, and it's actually in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 15. It's going to be on the screen, so we don't have to do Bible drill, okay? But it's going to be on the screen. Deuteronomy 15, starting in verse 7, it says, If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, uh, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. So this is very similar to 1 John, isn't it? Okay, uh, You've got a, a command to be generous with your brother in God's family. Uh, you, one of your brothers is in need. There's a command to be generous with them. There's a command to not harden in Deuteronomy or close your heart in 1 John 3. So there's a connection between our hearts and our money with this brother. And he says, uh, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but shall open your hand and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. And so what I want us to see first is that there is a direct connection between our hearts and our money, and that message is throughout all of the Bible. Okay, for, for all of the Bible, there's a connection between our hearts and our money. Uh, Jesus, Jesus said um, that where your heart is, there, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul speaks of being a cheerful giver or a giver from the heart. So there is a connection between our hearts and our money. A closed, hardened heart to a brother in need will not result in generosity. A closed, hardened heart to a brother in need will not express the love of God to this person. But there's more. Look at the next pass, next verse. It says, take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. Now hold on to that unworthy thought concept. We're coming back there. And you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cried to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. Now, this is talking about lending, okay, in verse 9. And he says, take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and that's connected to the seventh year idea. In, in the people of God in the Old Testament, the seventh year, debts would be released. Debts would be forgiven. And so what's happening here is that uh, take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and say, hey, this time's coming I don't want to lend this brother any money because I might not get this money back. And so generosity is exchanged for self-protection. I don't want to be generous. I've got it. I could help him. I don't want to be generous. I want to protect myself against loss. And so this unworthy thought comes into your head, and the unworthy thought is self-protection. I'm not going to sacrifice. I'm going to protect myself. And so I'm not going to lend. So rather than open heart and hand, we have a closed heart and hand because we don't want to lose. We don't want self-sacrifice. We want self-protection. Well, Deuteronomy calls us to be generous in the next verse. It says, You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him, before, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. In other words, if you're generous, God's going to be generous to you. That's what it's saying. If, you, if you're generous toward your brother and sister, God's going to be generous to you, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, to the poor in your Land. And so this passage is giving us a foundation for 1 John 3. And the understanding here is that an unworthy thought is not to enter our heads and our hearts to where we think it would be better to self-protect than to self-sacrifice. No, we're to, be, we're to be generous. We're to love sacrificially. Now the challenge is we, we so often don't want to do that. Now, there are certainly questions to answer here about wisdom and how do you how do you know who do you give to? How do you know who do you not? Like if I'm if I'm pulling up the exit ramp off 85, do I just give to that person right there? I mean, maybe they're a brother. They say God bless on their sign. Like there, there's all kind of questions that we need to answer and wrestle with. And so if we take the Bible as a whole, we find that there is a discerning heart and there's a closed heart. A discerning heart realizes my giving to this person will not be good for them, and so I don't give. Uh, 
Perhaps the money will make things worse. Perhaps they will use it for something hurtful. Perhaps the money will encourage bad choices. And so we have a discerning heart to not give to someone because we think it would not be good for them. A closed heart doesn't give to someone because it will not be good for me. I won't get it back. I won't get my money back. This will damage me. I won't have something I want because I've given this money to them. A discerning heart is concerned about this other person. A closed heart is concerned about this person. And John tells us, and Deuteronomy tells us, to not have a closed heart toward our brothers and sisters. If we have what they need and they need it, not have a, clo- have a discerning heart, but not a closed heart toward our brothers and sisters. Now, this certainly deals with more than money. Money is the context in the passage. It's about being generous with our things, our, our All the world's goods, it says. But this also is certainly about time. You know, you you maybe you have that that friend who's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ who is, man, just nasty needy. And you know, if you get on the phone with them, like it's gonna be a thing. Like you're gonna and as many cues as you give, you know that's gonna be a phone call. And that and again, you're laughing because you know like that unworthy thought can get in your mind. If I get into this, it's going to be a mess. Sometimes serving people who are nasty needy is just, it's just exhausting. You see them come and you're like, you know, you kind of take that 180 and go a different direction. Just because you know. And what can happen is we can start to close our hearts to people. And we can start to have unworthy thoughts of people. And instead of being generous and laying our lives down, we become self-protective. Rather than being self-sacrificing like Jesus, we can be self-protecting like Cain. But the command for us is to love like Jesus, to be generous with our love toward one another. And this, this is more evidence that we belong to Jesus. Look at verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth. By what? By loving in deed and truth. By opening our hearts to our brothers. By seeing a brother in need and meeting that need. By this we know that we are of the truth. And reassure, reassure our heart before him. So this, this generosity of heart, this, this self-sacrificial love toward others is evidence that we are of the truth. But there's a problem in verse 20. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Now what is this talking about? This word condemn is used, this word for condemn is used two places. It's used here in 1 John 3, Then it's used in Galatians 2, where Peter had mistreated some Gentile believers, and Paul said he stood condemned. Now, anytime we read the word condemn, we immediately go somewhere like Romans 8 that says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so we think of it as a judicial term. There's another way to understand this term, and it's the idea of our heart leading us astray. If we use the judicial term, we have to explain what 21 means, where it says, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Why would God being greater than our hearts not give us confidence before God if that's what it's talking about? And so what I think, what I think and other guys who have written who are much smarter than me, uh, smarter than I, sorry, smarter than I, uh, what, what those people have written and said is this, that what's going on in verse 20 is that our hearts For whenever our hearts are leading us astray in this matter of generosity, in this matter of self-sacrificial love, in in this matter, what, what it's saying is that our hearts are leading us astray. Whenever our hearts lead us astray, God is greater than our heart. Whenever our hearts lead us astray, God's greater than our heart, and and he knows everything. And so he's able to change us from a heart that's led astray to, in verse 21, beloved, if our heart does not condemn, if our heart is not led astray, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. This this connects right back to Deuteronomy 15, 
When, when we're generous and when we follow the commands of God, we trust him to provide. And so verse 22 does not become God becoming a genie and whatever, whatever we ask, we receive. No, no. What, we are generous with our goods and we trust God to provide. We're generous with our lives and we trust God to provide. It says whatever we ask of him because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. So we're generous with our money, we're generous with our time, we're generous with our lives, and we trust God to provide for us. Listen, we cannot out-generous God. We, we cannot, we cannot out-give what he will give to us. He's a good God, he's a good father. He's not a genie, but he's a good father and he takes care of his kids. And so John wants us to understand that we're called, it's a command. For us to love one another. We love one another in a sacrificial way. We don't love, love one another with a closed heart. We love one another with, with a, in a self-sacrificial, generous way. And we see someone in need, we move toward them, not away from them. And when our heart kind of doesn't want to do that because we're afraid of what it's going to do to us, God's greater than our heart. He changes our heart and he pushes us into that moment where we're able to love like Jesus and fulfill this command. And so how do, we, how do we apply this passage? Because it's hard. It's hard to love people that are hard to love. So how do we apply this command? I think it's simply this. Don't close your heart when Jesus has opened his. Don't close your heart when Jesus has opened his. This picture of Jesus laying down his life, we know that's pointing us to the cross. His arms outstretched, vulnerable, heart open. This is the love that we're, this is how we know what love is, and this is the love that we're commanded to have, a, a love that is self-sacrificial, heart open, not closed, self-sacrificing, not self-protective. That's the love that we're commanded to have. The challenge is that there are people in our lives who are hard to love this way. There may have been people in our lives who have hurt us this way. We've been, we've been sacrificial, and they've hurt us. And there could be a temptation to want to cover up and to start being self-protective instead of self-sacrificing. We close our hearts to our brothers and sisters. We stop loving one another. We stop living like Jesus. We can experience this in our friendships. We love one another and we hurt each other. And rather than working toward forgiveness and reconciliation, we close off our hearts to one another. Now listen, certainly there are some hurts that are so deep and some relationships so dysfunctional that forgiveness is about all you can get. But the question is, is our heart closed or is it open? Is our heart closed or is it open? We, we can't close our heart to a brother and sister because Jesus opened his heart to us. And so Paul writes in Ephesians 4.32, he says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. There's that heart word again. Tender-hearted, open-hearted, tender toward a brother or a sister. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Don't close your heart. Lay your life down. We see this in our families. We're husbands and wives. You know, you put two sinners in a home together and then say, hey, live together and love each other. Man, that's hard. It can be really hard. And what can happen is over time, over time and enough disappointment and frustration, rather than deal, we can start to close our hearts and just become roommates and pay bills together. And then we're Uber drivers and all the things. Instead of really opening our heart to one another and loving each other in a sacrificial way. Particularly husbands, we're called to love our wives like Christ loved the church. How did he do that? He laid his life down for her. Children and parents. Man, children and parents are going to sin against one another. Children and parents are going to sin against one another. And we can be tempted to get close toward each other instead of really opening our hearts to each other. I was talking with a, a teenager, a student, a few weeks ago, and he, he said this to me, and I thought it was so profound. He said, you know, I, I finally realized this is, my, this is my parents' first time to walk through life, too. I thought that was so profound. And I said, write that down and read it often. 
because it's true. We need to open our hearts toward each other, not close them. We need to do this in our faith family. You put sinners in a church. You put sinners in a church together. We will hurt each other. We will. Do you know why all the commands are in the Bible? Like love each other, be patient with each other, be kind to each other, bear with each other, forgive one another. All those are there because we need them. All those are there because people hurt each other. Church hurt is not new. We just have podcasts about it. Okay? People have been hurt in the church since the book of Acts. And we need to love each other. And so instead of talking about people you have beef with, talk to people you have beef with. Maybe bring somebody. Hey, can you help us work this out? Because we're both, you know, incapable of doing so, apparently. Man, don't close your heart toward, don't, don't let an unworthy thought get up in your head about somebody and you just kind of spin a narrative. Man, go to somebody. Hey, I heard this. Is this true? I heard this. Can you tell me about this? Have the conversations that need to be had. Talk about what's going on. Don't, don't let an unworthy thought and closed heart destroy what Jesus has built. We need to be generous and open-hearted with each other. Because here's the deal. You can't selectively wall off your heart with people. Um, you can't like build one panel of fence toward one person. Your heart doesn't work that way. Your heart will build a, a, a wall all the way around itself. Okay? You don't, you don't just selectively wall off one person. You start to wall off everybody. And when we do that, we're no longer loving one another the way Jesus calls us to. Now, perhaps that just made it harder, okay? <laughs> Which is why the last part of the passage is so important. The only power we have to obey this is not our good intentions, it's not our good emotions, it's not our good feelings. The power we have to do this is that the one who laid his life down for us abides in us. Look at verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandment abides in God, Okay, so he's that person staying connected to God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. It's our only hope, our only hope to live this way. Because everything in us wants to self-protect, wants to armor up, wants to push people away, wants to build fences and keep people out. Everything in us wants to do that. Jesus laid down his life for us and he calls us to lay down our lives for one another. And the only hope we have to do that is that he abides in us. That's the only, the only hope we have. It's the only power we have. Otherwise, we're going to be just like Cain. But we're called to lay our life down the way Jesus laid his life down and to do it for one another. And man, wouldn't that be beautiful to the watching world? Wouldn't that be beautiful, a beautiful counter community to the washing world? A group of people who love each other even when they don't like each other? A group of people who love one another even when they're hurt by each other? A group of people who, who love one another even when they're frustrated and all those things? Who have open hearts and open hands? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Let's pray to that end together. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, I pray that we would be uh, together, that we would be a, a community that's different than the world, that we would love each other, that we would lay down our lives for each other, that we would be generous with each other, with our, with our money if needed, with our time, with, our, with ourselves. And Lord, that we, would, that we would do that as an expression of love to you. Would you make us what this passage calls us to be? We're desperate for you. We, we've got no power in ourselves. We're helpless to do this on our own. And so we need you. We need your power and strength and your might to give us power to do it. So help us, Lord. Help us love with generosity and open hearts. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.